Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the philosophical literature from antiquity to our period, present period, fragments. Okay. Ah. In the, is it okay now? In the philosophical literature from antiquity to our present period, fragments are not very frequent, but they are by no means marginal. Some philosophers even chose to write fragments, as we all know, from some philosophers of the Romantic period to Horkheimer and Adorno, whose Dialetica dell'Illuminismo has the subtitle Philosophische Fragmente. And of course, the most prominent fragments of all are those of the pre-Socratics. All that is well known. In what follows, I want to talk about fragments which have been neglected. Or, to be more precise, I want to talk about the impact late antique fragments of critics of Christianity had on the early modern philosophy of religion and on the critique of Christianity. And that impact, in fact, has largely been neglected. However, I think it does deserve our full attention because it will contribute to a better understanding of the origins of modernity. Normally, we read in histories of philosophy that ancient philosophers contributed to the break with the tradition in the Enlightenment and in the early modern period. Mainly, we think of Epicurus, of Lucretius and other authors who, did, who inspired the early modern secularist enlightened movements. That is well known. But in fact, as recent research, research has shown, late antique authors, like the ones I'm going to refer to, also substantially inspired the early modern critics of Christianity and the early champions of secularism. What I'm going to do now in the following 35 minutes will be two things. First of all, I want to give an overview about the contributions of the late antique critics of Christianity, an overview which has to be somewhat superficial. But in the second part of my paper, I will concentrate on at least one argument in detail which belongs to the center of the philosophical enterprises of early modernity and enlightenment philosophy. Before I begin with these two points, I have to say some words about the transmission and the availability of the fragments of the three following authors. The first, you, you will know them all, but just a few words. The first one, Celsus, a Middle Platonist who wrote in the, uh, in around the year 180, a book entirely against the Christians. It's called Aletes Logos Sermo Verus. More than a hundred years later, Porphyry wrote a book, Contra Christianos, uh, part of it was written nearby at Marsala, Lilibayon at that time, Kata Christianon. And the last of the latest of the three anti Christian authors is the famous Imperatore Giuliano and his book Contra Galileos. Well, the texts of all of these authors were persecuted by the Christians. Emperor Constantine even ordered. Porphyry's book to be burned publicly. So, none of these books uh, has survived. We've only got fragments. Nowadays, these fragments are easily available. 
For example, in Italy, there are uh, the following editions. A, there are translations by Celso Porfirio and Giuliano Imperatore. You will all know that. Now, my point is, in the early modern era, say, in the 16th century, also in the 17th and 18th century, the situation was much more difficult. However, there were uh, uh, scholars and philosophers were beginning to recollect the fragments, and they became accessible from the late 15th century onwards. For example, Celsus, uh, uh, many fragments were preserved in Origen's book, Contra Celsum, which reappeared in 1481. It was reprinted and even translated very often. A bit more complicated was the case of Porphyry. In his case, there, was, there had also been one Christian refutation of his book against Christians. It was written by Eusebius of Caesarea, a, a refutation in 30 books. Porphyry was regarded so dangerous that it took 30 books to refute him. But these 30 books of Eusebius, which must have been full of quotations, were also destroyed by the Christians because of that content. But some famous persons did collect the remaining fragments, among them Hugo Grotius. Finally, Julian, the emperor, was refuted by Cyril of Alexandria and some other authors whose works were available. And so all of these three authors could be read at least the fragments which had survived. Now, um, now I begin my overview about the theoretical substance of the contained in the fragments of the uh, late antique critics of Christianity. And first of all, I will say a few words about um, their contribution to the philo philosophy of religion in particular and the philosophy of revelation, the critique of the Bible. All of the three pagan, Platonist, Neoplatonist critics of Christianity um, attacked the canon of the holy books of the Bible. Most prominently, Porphyry proved that the book of Daniel was a fake. If I may quote Donald Trump, it is a f it's a fake revelation. And in fact, it is. The book of Daniel, supposedly written by the prophet during the Jewish exile, was not the author. It was an anonymous person about 600 or 700 years later. It's a real fake. And by showing that, Porphyry shattered the foundations of Christian eschatology. Well, eschatology is, of course, rooted in the book of Daniel. And his arguments were read from the 16th century onwards. That's a highly important inspiration. Another point. The thesis that Moses is, was not the author of the Pentateuch, 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 um, was also put forward by the late antique critics of Christianity and received by their early modern and enlightenment readers. Not only this, but also the hypothesis who was the real author of the Pentateuch. For example, we find in Porphyry the thesis that it was Ezra, the scribe, who wrote the, the Pentateuch, a thesis which was transmitted to, most famously, to Thomas Hobbes in his Leviathan and Baruch Spinoza in his theological political treatise, a very important, prominent thesis which was apt to shatter the authority of the Bible. And finally, in many ex exegetical details, the late antique authors inspired the early modern readers. Just to give one example, it was 
Porphyry, but also Julian, who pointed out that in the famous verse of Jesaja, that a virgin will give birth to a son, the Hebrew word Alma does by no means signify virgin, but just a young woman. Huh? That also that argument was put in, uh, transmitted to the early modern debates on Christianity through the reading of the fragments of the late antique authors. I'll have to leave it there and proceed to another field of discussions which was very central for the early modern period and the Enlightenment, namely a discussion about a special problem of metaphysics and philosophy of religion, that is miracles. Again, I have to be very short and confine myself to just five elements which the early modern and enlightenment critics of Christianity could take from the late antique critics of Christianity. A very important point is the first one. Uh, we often read that antiquity had no idea of natural laws, that that was a modern idea, that critics of miracles uh, employed a modernist idea in order to criticize Christian or biblical miracles. But that was not the case. A reader of the fragments of Celsus, Porphyry, and Julian could see there that they had at their disposition a very clear idea of nomoi tes physios. And these laws were, in, um, were somewhat more liberal in antiquity, but according to the ancient philosophers, there were natural laws which could not be violated. For example, by raising, by the raising, the resuscitating of dead persons. Second, an epistemological argument according to which a miracle, even if we would concede that it had happened, was not able to prove the truth of a doctrine. It sounds to be a simple argument, but is a very fruitful argument and even a lethal argument against the Christian conception of miracles. Equally simple but very devastating was the argument that miracles are ubiquitous. In the late antique authors, we've always of, very often find um, a, a hint at a contemporary philosopher of Jesus Christ, namely Apollonius of Tyana, the famous Pythagorean who worked many, many miracles uh, syn synchronically with Christ. Yeah? And it was, a, it was a real fun for both the late antique critics of Christianity as for their modern readers to show that, well, Except, except the um, raising of dead, which was, which was just a legend, the other miracles of Jesus were something which was equally reported of his contemporaries. So it doesn't prove anything. Um, then there is an argument which, is, uh, which uh, um, has in its core the, an idea which later, later on was um, put forward by David Hume in his famous uh, chapter of miracles in his inquiry, namely that miracles need a special attestation. I, I cannot go into detail here because of lack of time and um, will end my remarks on the discussions about miracles uh, with, uh, some, uh, with a word about a topic which was vividly discussed in the late ancient author, late, late antique authors, namely the possibility of bodily resurrection. What will happen of our atoms when we have died? How can we get an identical, numerically identical body in the afterworld? So all these topics come back in the 17th century and the Enlightenment and you always see, if you have a close look at the texts of the 17th and 18th century, that these authors had read the fragments. 
They do not always name Celsus and Julian, but you can find, if you have a look at the details, that in fact they read them. For example, there is an argument against the, res the resurrection of Jesus in the famous English deist Thomas Chubb. Celsus is not mentioned, but in fact it is a paraphrase of Celsus's argument. Um, I regret, you will find it on the handout, and it's, it's, a, it's a funny quotation. But I have to proceed, for time reasons, to the next chapter, namely the de debate about morality, justice, grace, and Christian morality. In this case, too, the pagan Platonists were highly critical of the Christian conception um, in this field, namely in the field of morality. Uh, I confine myself to only three examples. One is the, the, the attack of the pagan philosophers on Christian virtues. According to the pagan philosophers, Christian virtues are some, some are trivial, some are okay, and those are those virtues which were taken from the Jews, that's from the Old Testament, but that what is specific in Christianity are virtues which are exaggerated. For example, humility, tape notes. Uh, it is good to be self-critical, it is good to be not too proud, but Christians say you have to walk in sack and ashes, you have always to say I'm a I'm a, I'm a bad creature, I'm a sinner, and so on. Permanent self-accusations, and that is an insalubrious exaggeration. And that, and that idea is really characteristic of Christianity. Jews don't think that way, but Christians do. And that was scandalous for the uh, ancient uh, critics of Christianity and for the Enlightenment critics of Christianity who were inspired by them. Another example is the ideal to, of, of love of one's enemy. The pagan philosophers say love, uh, no, to, to um, love of one's neighbor, one of one's fellow creatures is a good thing. And it is good not to be cruel to your enemy, but to love one's enemy is a psychological impossibility and a, an idiotic exaggeration, as they put it. Then, the most important point is that the Christian answer of what it means to live a good life came under attack by the pagan philosophers. The Christian idea is that moral activity does not count if we read the epistles of St. Paul, which were attacked by the pagan philosophers. It is not activity, but grace, which is a gift we get from God. Huh? And that idea is destructive of morality. That's a very new point in the critique of Christianity, which came into the discussion only after the fragments of the three pagans became accessible. And it's a very central idea in Enlightenment anti-Christianism. And the same can be said about the critique of uh, rituals and sacramental atonement. Well, after these rather short overviews, I will now concentrate on a problem which is central, both in antiquity and in the Enlightenment discussions. It's the debate about what it is to have to form a belief, what faith is, and what the consequences of certain conceptions of belief or faith are, namely the damnation of error and pluralism. In all of the late antique authors, we find repeatedly one accusation which sounds very simplistic. It is, it, it, it reads, Christian faith is a kind of irrational belief, 
Alogos pistis. It's found in Porphyry and all the others. That doesn't sound very sophisticated, I must admit. However, if we have a closer look at the texts of Porphyry, Celsus and Julian, we see that this phrase, irrational belief, is an abbreviation of a sophisticated and well-developed argument. And I will now show you that argument which proceeds in uh, six steps. And this argument, which I now uh, rep represent to you, present to you on the basis of the late antique authors, was picked up by many, by numerous Enlightenment and early modern philosophers. The first step is, well, no, the first step is, first, the bold accusation that Christian faith, faith is uncritical, anexetastos. <laughs> it is not based on the examination of arguments. Celsus says, according to the Christians, faith or the belief in the religious doctrines is not based on ex the examination of arguments. The Christian's device is, do not investigate. Christians, Celsus adds, who do not wish either to give or receive a reason for their belief, keep repeating, do not examine but believe. Celsus, in order to substantiate this charge, refers to those many imperatives given by Jesus. He says, believe. And no further argument. That's how uh, um, Celsus sees his charge um, substantiated. The next step is, goes, goes further. According to the Christians, Porphyry and Celsus say, faith is not the result of reasoning but it is the result of a decision, of free choice, of the voluntary assent to religious doctrines. In other words, it is what we nowadays call doxastic voluntarism. That is the idea that you can freely decide to believe something. You see in the first quotation, Faith is a, is a matter of choice. Prohiresis is the word they use. You, you, you can choose to believe a doctrine A or doctrine B as if you were in a restaurant and would choose this or that meal. Now, and that is in fact doxastic voluntarism. Celsus puts it this way, the last quotation, on the, uh, as, as you see it there on the screen, uh, the Christians have, the Christian faith has taken possession of the mind from the outset before examining the arguments. It's at first a decision. Huh? It's a decision to give assent to a doctrine. Now, and this, according to ancient philosophers as well as modern philosophers, is an absurd epistemology. Giving assent depends on the given evidence. And if evidence is there, we cannot choose to give assent or not to give assent. Huh? It's, in principle, it's a trivial point, but it's an important point that for Christians, Faith is a voluntary thing. And it's, it is a, this uh, accusation seems quite bold, but it is fair. We find in several fathers of the church explicitly the claim of doxastic voluntarism. Faith is a matter of um, free will. That's what Christians themselves th say and what those Platonists opponents reject. 
Now, the next step will be very important because due to its voluntary nature, faith or belief is meritorious and will be rewarded. It is the condition of salvation. And of course, only if faith is voluntary, it can be rewarded or criticized. You cannot reward a non-voluntary action or event. And correspondingly, due to its voluntary nature, faith can be demanded. It makes sense that Jesus says, believe me, without an argument, just have the will to believe me. Huh? Now, the consequences become even more dramatic. See step number five. Unbelief too is voluntary. Therefore, unbelief deserves to be punished. Porphyry refers to the famous verse in Mark's Gospel 1616, uh, saying that Christ threatens eternal punishment to those who do not believe in him. And again, it must be said, if you are a doxastic voluntarist, it makes sense. If you do not believe, it is not a mistake, it is a sin. You could have done otherwise. If you don't believe, it is because you don't want to believe. You can never excuse yourself and say, I cannot believe. Doxastic voluntaries say, you can, whenever you want. So, and from this springs a last and even more dramatic consequence. Namely, religious toleration is not appropriate. Since false beliefs are the result of voluntary decisions, it is not right to tolerate them. Celsus even has a word, anechistai, for tolerate. The Christians, therefore, cannot bear to see temples and altars and images and the beliefs of other religions. So, let me sum up this point. The Christian conception of faith, or belief, is a kind of doxastic voluntarism. Its main consequences are, first, the moralization of faith or belief. That means voluntary belief is not morally neutral, but it is meritorious. The second consequence is the criminalization of error and dissent. Error is not a fault or a mistake, but an offense. It is a crime arising from an evil will. The third consequence is the justification of persecution and intolerance. For, for a Christian, it is possible to force men to the right faith because everybody can voluntarily change his beliefs. And it is obligatory and even beneficial for those who have the wrong faith to force men to the right faith as otherwise they would suffer eternal damnation. Now, as I said, these ideas are ubiquitous in authors of the Enlightenment and of the 17th century and you can see it verbatim, you can see these parts of this, argument, of this argument and the whole argument repeated even verbatim, although often the, the authors, Celsus and the others, are not named. I just give, if I have still three minutes, um, a few, a very few examples of numerous references um, in 18th and 17th century authors who profited from these late antique authors. The first author is the Pope of the Atheists, the Baron d'Holbach. He was uh, an intense reader of Celsus and the others, as, as, as can be shown from his library catalogue and from the references he gives. And he says, yes, indeed, Christianity demands a, 
a blind submission, une soumission aveugle à l'autorité des prêtres. And in the sense, the ancient authors say it, it forbids doubt and examination. La religion chrétienne interdit le doute et l'examen. Another author, also a famous um, protagonist of the radical enlightenment, 18th century radical enlightenment, Jean-Baptiste de Mirabeau wrote a whole book in which he reformulated the arguments of the late antique critics of Christianity and gave the book the title Le Celse Moderne. It was reprinted several times, many manuscripts, copies circulated. And for Mirabeau too, the key of the, 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 the center of the problem is that the Christians, as doxastic vol voluntarists, moralized belief and unbelief, and that they damned error as voluntary. Les premiers chrétiens ne voyaient dans des erreurs volontaires que malice. Just two short other examples. A German, one of the key figures of the German Enlightenment and the most radical critic of Christianity, Hermann Samuel Remarus, author dei Framenti dell'Anonimo di Wolfenbüttel, pubblicato in Italia in 1977, a really central figure, has all of these arguments and also sees that the idea that assent and belief is voluntary is the main epistemological sin of Christianity and it is an epistemological sin which has terrible political and other practical consequences, namely intolerance. And Ramau says the right view is the following view which was exposed, for example, by Celsus. See the third, uh, the third quotation. The study of truth is under our control and it is an action, whereas faith is not voluntary. And a last quotation by a famous English deist, Peter Annett summarized this argument, as, which, which he uh, uh, reproduces in detail. He summarizes that argument as follows, saying, every man must believe what appears to him to be true and cannot believe otherwise. Therefore, belief cannot be a duty. To make belief meritorious, or the want of it criminal, is a mark of imposture, for truth requires a reasonable conviction, not a blind obedience. To sum up, um, in the early, the early critics of Christianity have influenced critical philosophy of religion in the early modern period in the Enlightenment in a very substantial way which has been overlooked and neglected. It might be said that the fragments, although it's only fragments and not the entire books which did not survive, that these fragments were a kind of messaggio di bottiglia, can I say that? <laughs> With an explosive content and the explosion came to 12 centuries later when those messages were picked up. And we must take the argumentative substance of these fragments very seriously if we want to understand the origins of modernity and in particular the emancipation from the Christian tradition which for a considerable part was made possible by these three late ancient critics of Christianity. Thank you. Okay.